So good evening. We'll go ahead and call tonight's regular board meeting to order. If you would stand and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. I apologize, I skipped roll call. Everyone's here except Mr. Gilbert, and he has the luxury of being in Florida. So, uh, Mrs. Christensen, would you like to take the first board salute, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> the board salutes Mike Stump Sumter for his dedicated service to Greater Clark County Schools for the past 33 years. Mr. Sumter passed away on Tuesday, October 23rd. Mike demonstrated an effective and positive work ethic and his time with the district is valued and appreciated. Greater Clark County Schools is disheartened to lose such a wonderful employee. Is that? Jack, uh, very, very sorry for your loss. And um, I didn't have the good fortune of being able to meet your father. All I can tell you is everyone I talked to about him spoke so highly of him. And we so greatly appreciate everything that, that he did for our school corporation. Everyone's important to our family. And at least maybe this gives you some sense of how much we appreciated your father. Thank you very much, Would you please talk about the Morgan, uh, I'm sorry, about Morgan Riley from JHS? Sure, thank you. Congratulations to Jeffersonville High School tennis player Morgan Riley for being selected to receive the 2012 Barbara S. Wine Award. The award is given to the outstanding girl in Central Indiana Junior Tennis who best exhibits a high degree of sportsmanship, an excellent mental attitude, superb playing ability, and works to promote, promote the game of tennis. Congratulations, Morgan. Morgan, for Poland. <laughs> you know, uh, Morgan, uh, we really so appreciate you and what being such a great ambassador for your school and our school system. I know that you're not making your customers stay up in front of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please talk about Golf for Kids? Yes, my pleasure. Thank you. <coughs> On October the 8th, the GCCS Educational Foundation held their 12th annual Golf for Kids event at the Jeffersonville Elks Club. All the proceeds for the event and the fund for the Foundation's Advanced Placement Pro Scholarship Program, which covers testing fees associated with AP exams. The board salutes the 25 businesses and community members that participated in some capacity by forming a team, sponsoring a hole, or donating a door prize. Thanks to the individuals and businesses, the foundation raised over $25,000 to fund their initiative. The board would like to publicly thank insulated roofing contractors for donating $7,500 and to George Fowlson and Company for donating $5,000, or Mr. P. Trucking for donating $2,500, and for our community bank for donating $2,500, and the Louisville Slugger for donating over $2,000 in merchandise.
and uh, Mrs. Kraft, uh, Eric Ballinger, who's the uh, the president of the foundation board, was not able to be here tonight to accept it. But uh, obviously, you know, um, and Mrs. Christensen serving in a, your capacities on that board, how valuable um, the foundation is to our school corporation. So we really appreciate what the foundation does for us. Mr. Pavey, would yes. you please talk about Rachel's challenge? I would love to talk about Rachel's challenge. <clears throat> Students in Charlestown Middle School recently had the opportunity to hear the story of Rachel Scott, the first victim of the Columbine school shootings in 1999. Rachel's Challenge is a series of students empowered programs and strategies that equip students and adults to combat bullying and uh, alley feelings of isolation and despair by creating a culture of kindness and compassion. Seventh and eighth grade students attended Rachel's Impact Assembly and sixth grade students attended Rachel's Story Assembly. Charlestown Middle School also hosted a Rachel's Challenge event for the entire Charlestown community. Over 450 students, parents, staff, and community members attended the event held at Charlestown High School. The board salutes Charlestown Middle School Principal Karen Wesley and Assistant Principal Tim LaGrange for coordinating this wonderful program. The board would also like to publicly thank the local businesses who provided financial support to bring Rachel's Challenge to Charlestown Middle students and the Charlestown community. Thank you to the Charlestown Parks and Recreation, Jeffersonville FOP Lodge Number 100, New Washington State Bank, McDonald's, St. Catherine Regional Hospital, River, River Crossing Assisted Living, and Dr. William Voskel. Both Karen and Tim are here this evening, and Karen and Tim, on behalf of our administrative team, our school board, thank you so much uh, for taking this initiative on. It's uh, uh, Any time that we can provide a level of special service to kids, uh, showing how much we care about them as a community, it's amazing. And I know this was a, a, a brainchild uh, of yours, and uh, what a great event it was. And in fact, it's something we probably need to be thinking about on even a broader scale in our school corporation. So as a token of our appreciation, we just want to give a, a certificate to both you, Karen, and Tim for everything that you've done to to help us look uh, even stronger as a school corporation. Mr. Satterley, if you would um, recognize Nicholas Mudd, please. Sure. The board salutes Jeffersonville High School's junior Nicholas Mudd. Nicholas was nominated to receive the Louisville Rose Award for saving the life of a four-year-old girl this past summer while, while lifeguarding at the Galt House Hotel. Nicholas performed CPR on the child, and his fast reaction ultimately saved the child's life. Nicholas was recognized at the Louisville Rose Award event on Tuesday, October 30th. Although Nicholas was not selected to receive the award, recognition from the community, the school board, and his heroic efforts are warranted. We salute Nicholas Mudd. Wow. That's the best part of the meeting. 
if there's if there's anyone who chooses not to stay for the boring part of the meeting, you are more than welcome to leave at this time. We usually get a few takers. We get that or not? We get that option. at this time we need um, we don't have any recommendations from administration for approval changes correct no. I mean agenda changes correct? Right. correct I need a motion from the board to approve tonight's agenda motion to approve all right thank you mr. Satterley is there a second I'll second thank you mr. white any discussion all in favor 6 oh thank you Next, we have approval of minutes from previous meetings. We have executive session, regular meeting, and special meeting. Unless there's an objection, we'll take all three at the same time. Motion to approve. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Pavey. Any discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Thank you. I do believe we have some public comments this evening, correct, Dr. Mallon? That is correct. Uh, we have um, three students. Uh, who would like to speak uh, related to the JHS principal matter? Uh, would you like to explain the process? Or? Sure. Um, anyone wishing to speak to the board has an opportunity to do so. I just want to make sure that you understand we have a three-minute rule. At about two and a half minutes, you'll hear a, a, a alarm beep, and that's just to let you know to wind up. Um, we do ask that you uh, refrain from addressing any individual staff, um, board members, or anything along those lines. Um, if you have any literature that you'd like to hand out to us before you speak, you can do that. And so I think pretty much that's, that's it, and we'll go ahead with our first speaker. Cameron Blankenship. Welcome, Cameron. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for hearing uh, what I would like to address tonight. As most of you know, over the past few weeks, there have been a great deal of, a deal of turmoil in the halls of Jeffersonville High School. We as students have had our principal taken from us and legal, legal ramifications raise serious issues for the interim replacements. This is not what we as a student body deserve at all. Now, I understand that at least five of you have already decided to decline bringing James Sexton back as principal of Jeffersonville High School. I am also aware that seldom could one person, let alone a student, change, change the minds of experienced politicians as yourselves. However, I am not merely speaking as an individual, but rather on behalf of my school, behalf of my peers, my fellow students. Um, it, it's a shame to see Mr. Sexton go, and, and with good reasons, he has completely changed the outlook of Jeff High. Not only has he raised test scores and giving us more opportunities for AP courses, he has raised to, to us to the, uh, the national level. Ladies and gentlemen, we, we are growing and moving forward, and James Sexton is the cause of this. Providing that he does not come back, we fear his policies will be changed. And above all, we fear that a different principal will not have the same passion and perseverance that James Sexton has towards our personal education. At this time, I would like to provide you with some information that the student body would like to, for us to be aware of. And with all due respect, you're not fooling any of us. And do not make us out for fools. You make your decisions for your own personal political gain on your own time. But I, I, I do not, and I repeat, I do not play, pol play politics with our education. You call yourself advocates for students and advocates for education. 
act like it. Listen to the voices of your fellow students and for the people that you have promised to provide an education to. Um, now, uh, a statement was, was released saying that uh, the removal of James Sexton was for a difference in leadership techniques. Uh, I regret to inform a lot of you that it's a part of being an, an administrator in education and any work-related work force. You are going to have differences in, in opinions no matter where you go. I, uh, all, all I can ask is I beg you to consider what we as students have said. And I, I urge you to take in what me as a representative of my student body has said. And thank you. Thank you, Cameron. I believe next is Shelby Osborne. Before I begin, I would like to thank the board and Dr. Mellon for allowing me to speak before you today. I'm here to represent the Jacksonville High School student body and the fact that we all feel the same betrayal that some of the board has re as respected leaders of the community has been so secretive and manipulative towards the students that care about their education and who this all affects. Sexton did not play political games like so many others had and he decided instead to do what was best for the students, to be able to succeed academically. He brought uh, was, uh, he was brought here from retirement because he was able to bring Eastern High School to supremacy to put them in the top 100 schools not only in Kentucky but the whole country. This was the first time anyone had ever done this in the JCPS school system. He brought our school out of academic suspension and caused by the previous administration at our school. Sexton actually cared for the students and showed us through various ways. He attended every art fair, concert, athletic event, and theater production to show his support. He brought us together as a student body for the first time in years. I know this because I'm a third generation Jeff High School student. And one of my family members actually attended the original Jeff High School before it was moved to the Allison Lane. I have heard many stories and experiences from former, uh, of the former state of the school. I'm ashamed that we finally found someone who knows what he is doing and was demoted for doing absolutely nothing wrong. The board even stated in their press release that sex has done nothing wrong legally, morally, ethically, or physically. This has been an action and political game, and Mr. Sexton knows the participation in arts and athletics improves grades and encourages student involvement in school pride. Sexton's removal shows the GCS school system has become a school system in which most of the students being under 18 are unable to vote and have no say in. And the students in the school system are losing. The unity of the school that Sexton has created is being diminished in its absence, and a house divided cannot stand. We are one of the best AP programs in the state, and an anonymous previous Providence student says that we have more college prep classes than his old college prep school. The graduation rate has increased. He's, and a lot of us just wonder why the board was so secret and it is. We, when it, students, parents, and teachers had no <coughs> idea what was going on until they went home and watched the 6 o'clock news. And the secretism is casting a negative image on all the greater Clark County school systems, not just Jeff High. The body cannot move forward without a good, clear head to direct it. <coughs> and without Sexton at the head of the student body, we cannot find its way. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Cody Jones. <coughs> to start off, I'd like to thank Dr. Mellon and the board members for allowing me the opportunity to speak at this meeting. As you all know, we are here to discuss the issues concerning Jeffersonville High School's beloved ex-principal, James Sexton. He was loved by his students and faculty alike, and he genuinely cared and loved his students. I feel I could safely say that upon his suspension, many were shocked. Add to the confusion over the suddenly removed principal and the amount of, and was the amount of secrecy surrounding the situation. Faculty members were told very little to no information, and the students even less. Leaving parents at the end of the line, concerned parents after calling the administration were given the runaround. After hearing the official statement that there were no concerns of related to illegal activity, and the real issue was nothing more than management and leadership philosophies that 
differ, students, teachers, and parents were outraged. Mr. Sexton did not play politics well, stated an anonymous staff member at GFI. He put the students first. This shows that Sexton cared more about doing what, what he felt was right and leading the school for the students' sake than he did about playing politics. School board member Nancy Kraft also saw this in an interview with the Career Journal. She stated, it looks to me like they just wanted to get rid of everyone who came in with Ashton from Kentucky. She also stated that kids at Jeff High are going to be the ones who suffer. The truth lies within the data. Since Sexton came to be principal, graduation rate, test scores, and attendance rates for Jeffersonville High School have all improved, and the school is no longer on academic probation. Before Sexton, many were turned away from Jeffersonville. Five years ago, I wouldn't have sent my dog to Jeff High. Now it's more a respectable school, said a faculty member who chose to remain anonymous. The senior counselor, Mr. Churchman, says that now Jeffersonville High School offers enough AP classes that the students will be able to graduate from high school with enough college credit to save the associate to get an associate's degree. So why remove the principal who achieved this? Joey Kelso, a parent of Jeffersonville High School student, stated, a mother should be superintendent. Maybe then the school will be less about politics and more about what's right for the students. Sexton's removal was nothing more than for political gain. The student protest showed the board just how important the Sexton was to the students at J5. These aren't delinquents. Most of these students were intelligent honor students. Many teachers also advocated for the protest. For students to get organized and hold the protest and willingly accept the consequences. They had truly cared about their principles. So I leave you today with this. Students want him back. Teachers want him back. Parents want him back. As the elected representatives of Greater Clark County School Systems, perhaps it's, perhaps it's time for you to start representing the people who elected you. Thank you. It's common board practice for us not to address or respond to anybody who comes before us to speak, but because you all are our students, I actually would like to give Dr. Mallon, as Mr. Sexton's direct supervisor, an opportunity to respond. First of all, I have a lot of respect for the students, not only here tonight, that came to speak on Mr. Sexton's behalf, but also the dozen students that I spoke to um, directly at Jeffersonville High School uh, shortly after some of these decisions were made. You know, um, as a superintendent of schools, it's an obligation that I have that when matters come to my attention, I will always thoroughly investigate those matters and make decisions that are, in my opinion, in the best interest of our school corporation. And in this case, that's exactly what I did. Now, there's some people that think that there's some other conspiracy behind this, that uh, uh, the board uh, told me what to do or whatnot, and I will tell you without question, this was my decision. It's a decision that I made based upon my investigation. Uh, the board had no direct knowledge of any of my decisions related to this. I own the decision and the board has the right to either support that decision or not. All I can do is act with integrity based upon everything that I know and make the best decision I can with the information I have. And that's what I've done in this case. Now, one thing that mentioned, I, that um, I believe Cameron mentioned is the students don't deserve this. I 100% agree that you don't deserve what's happening to you and it's very unfortunate that it is. But I will also tell you by being in the building and seeing the leadership of the adults in the building, the administrators who are still there, the counseling staff, the teachers, all the other staff members, and the students, I've been very, very proud of how everyone associated with Jeffersonville High School has stepped up and handled this very difficult situation. And moving forward, it is going to be ultimately my responsibility to make sure that that building continues to move forward in a positive direction. And I take that very seriously and I guarantee that I will do everything in my power to make sure that Jeffersonville High School continues uh, to move forward in a very positive manner to become one of the premier high schools in, in the state of Indiana and in the region. So I wish that I could be 
provide more details and more specifics, but there are confidentiality rights that are involved here. And due to that, then this is the best that I can offer at this point. But I felt it's very important that you, as students, and the public heard from me, again, that that is, I own my decision, and I take full responsibility for my decision, and to make the recommendation to the board, this is my responsibility, and has nothing to do with anything else as much as other people in our community want to believe that to be true. I care about our students. I dedicate myself to our students. Every, ever since I came in here, I said students first. I believe that to my core. I've done it for 30 years. I'm not going to let you down at Jeffersonville High School. I, I know that you feel that way now, and I don't blame you for your feelings, but I guarantee you that I'm going to do what it takes to keep the high school moving in the direction that it deserves. And I, I also just want to take a quick opportunity um, to address, I heard a, a, a common theme um, from the three of you that really upset me per, to my heart. Not, I'm not upset at you. I'm upset at my heart that you, ha that you feel this way. Um, when I first decided to run for the board four and a half years ago, the reason I did that was because I saw politics up here, and I saw kids down here, and I didn't like that. I had three kids in this school system, and I didn't think that was right. My whole objective the last four and a half years is to make you all our priority. And we've, we've, we're getting there. We've got a ways to go, but we're getting there. I just want to assure you all, this board has nothing politically to gain. The only thing we have to gain is when our students leave us and they're prepared and ready to be successful. I just want to assure you all of that from myself personally. And thank you all for coming. Next, we have the consent agenda. Need a motion to approve. Madam President, could we separate item five personnel uh, from certified and classified? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So I would make a motion to accept one, two, three, four, and six as presented. I second the motion. Uh, certified and classified, you want those voted on separately? Please. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right. Um, so we're, I need a motion to approve items one, two, three, four, and six. No, yeah, I, 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 we we just need to vote. Nancy, yes, she unless Nancy there was discussion. So the motion was to approve. I yes. thought you were One, making two, a motion three, four, to separate. Six and separate. Okay, so you're asking to approve items one, two, three, four, and six. Yes, ma'am. Okay, With and there second. was a, that was Miss Craft second. Second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? All right. Thank you. And then we have um, consent agenda item five. Certified. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Motion to approve, Mr. Satterley. Thank Second. you. Second. Second, Mr. Pavey. Any discussion? All in favor? And opposed? That's 4 2. Thank you. Classified? I need a motion to approve. Right. Motion to approve. Ms. Christensen, thank you. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Pavey, thank you. Any discussion on classified? All in favor? And opposed? 5-1. Thank you. Next is gifts to buildings. It's your turn, Christina. That's a long one. Oh, it's my turn? Okay. That's a long one. All right. Um, we have almost $13,000 donated to our schools from the public. Um, I'll point out uh, Community Foundation of Southern Indiana, $1,500 in the way of computers. Um, the Tennis Club, $2,000 for Tennis Shelter. 
PTO at Parkwood, $2,952 for after school enrichment programs. Um, Big Frog Custom T-shirts made a donation to River Valley in the amount of $1,762. So we, we acknowledge all of our donors um, pointing out the largest ones and we just want to say thank you to our community for continuing to support our schools. Is there a motion to approve? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Is there a second? Mm -hmm. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Thank you. Next we have action items. And uh, board, I would ask at this time that Mrs. Lewis, she's already made her way, and she's going to address the uh, policies that are before you this evening. Good evening and thank you. Uh, we have a variety of policies that have been under discussion and then for first reading, and now we're ready to take them for second reading so that they can actually be uh, updated in our policy manuals and then implemented. There are three of them, items uh, subject on action items number one, number two, and number four. Number one is revision to policy 1260 adult uh, school support groups. Revision and the number two is revisions to policy 5144 pupil discipline. And the fourth one is new policy 6143 Indiana assessment system testing security. All three of these are presented for second reading and no changes have been made to these policies since they were presented for discussion on September 18th and then for first reading on October the 2nd. So my recommendation is that you would take the three of these policies uh, together for approval unless you have any questions at this time. I'm, the, I'm sorry, which policy? Items number one, number two, and number four. All right, is there a motion on that? <laughs> Ms. Kraft, thank you. Second. All right, so we're taking one, two, and four all in one vote. Any discussion? All in favor? 6 oh. Thank you. Then if you'll um, look at policy number 5144.5, Community Service for Students, it's item number three, and it is up for a second reading, and if I'll give you a chance to flip to that one in your um, data that you have before you and provide that we did make a change in that one just for clarification purposes. That one was the policy on um, community service that was part of a, a discipline and uh, action rather than just a regular community service action. So we made changes if you can, uh, Renee, if you'll go back up to the top of the policy. Uh, we indicated in lieu of suspension or expulsion just for clarifications on this policy number and then based on your all's concerns or questions if you can flip down a little bit Renee to item number three you were concerned about how often we would get reports about the uh, feedback from the entity that would be the sponsor again these are all nonprofit organizations so rather than just say we would get progress reports we indicated weekly and you wanted to make sure that uh, persons that were working in a supervisory role with our students were uh, subject to the criminal history report. So we would make sure that those individuals had a report on file with their employer. So based on those additions from the conversations we had in discussion and first reading, uh, we would recommend your adoption of this policy at this time. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mrs. Kraft. Second, Second, Mr. White. Thank you. Any discussion on this particular policy? I think you did a wonderful job clarifying all of our concerns, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. All in favor and opposed? 5-1. And then uh, if you'll flip to item number five, this is revisions to policy 9300, regular and special meetings. And we did make some changes because you had some questions. And before you this evening, in fact, uh, what we initially loaded on board docs, you all had the chance to take a look at it, and you still had some concerns about the uh, having persons speak on non-agenda items. And, and the message that we received and that Dr. Mellon received was that you wanted to make sure that our constituents had the opportunity to make public comments on both public and 
agenda and non-agenda items at both meetings. So I'll draw your attention to the second page of this policy, and it should be in front of you. I think Renee gave you an updated version this evening. And if you'll look under um, item L, public comments on non-agenda items, you'll see that we added that to the second meeting of the month. It was already in there for the first meeting of the month. And um, that was, and then under both of those, under the first meeting and the second meeting on public comments on non-agenda items, we put a little asterisk in there and ask for your consideration on this. And, and just to read it, if the comments relate to a speaker's concern about an issue, the board requests the speaker make an attempt to follow the chain of command beginning at the lowest administrative level before bringing the issue to the board's attention. Additionally, compliance with policy 8400 regarding citizens' comments should occur. That policy is, again, you have to make the request to be on the agenda. You have to comply with the three-minute rule. But we thought that if we put that in there, they would have the opportunity to make their concerns known on non-agenda items at both of the meetings, and we just ask them. We're not demanding it. We're not directing it. We're not dictating it. But we're asking them to try, to the best of their ability, to start at the lowest common denominator level with their concerns before it comes to you. If that's not something they feel they can deal with, that's certainly their choice, and we will not turn anybody away as a result of that. But we thought maybe that would help clarify. So with that, those changes added, we again would ask that you would consider adoption of the second reading with the changes as noted. A motion to approve as, revi as revised. Motion to approve, Ms. Shiley. I'll second. Second, Mr. White. Any discussion? I just want to thank Sandy for making those changes that we discussed in by emails over the weekend. I appreciate that. Happy to do it. Sandy, just clarification on that. I mean, this may be a situation where someone calls in and wants to speak on a non-agenda item, and we would try to sort of intercept that up front and see if we can sell it before we actually put them on the agenda. I mean, that's the kind of things you're talking about, right? right? You know, they have to call in and, and speak with Renee to get on the agenda, and certainly she could say, you know, is there, is, have you had the chance to talk with, like, the teacher or the building principal or, you know, the assistant superintendent or the superintendent about this? You know, have you had the chance to kind of go through the chain of command? And if they say, I'm not comfortable with doing this, you know, I want to do this, I want to, I, I think I want to go to the board first, certainly that would be their right by virtue of having the right in this policy. But if Renee can assist them by saying, well, you know, let me help you by giving you the name of Mr. Hare, you know, our assistant superintendent to talk with. If, if there's a way that we internally can help them so that they can get their uh, issues addressed prior to having to come to the board, we'll try to work with them. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion or questions? I, too, just want to say thank you, Dr. Mellon and Sandy, um, for um, our, our little back and forth <laughs> emails over the weekend. We appreciate that. All in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. For the, uh, the next action item is also policy related, but it would be a first reading. And I'd like to have uh, Assistant Superintendent Travis Hare uh, bring this up to for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Mellon and Board. <clears throat> this is a, a look at the uh, attendance policy, and just for the board's uh, a little bit of uh, background, in 2008, we uh, revamped the attendance policy for elementary, middle, and high school. Uh, we feel like that the attendance policy is working very well at our elementary and middle schools, um, but we had some concerns at the high school level, and just to refresh your memory, the attendance policy for high school students, we tied their attendance into their grade. So if a student missed more than nine days, they, they could get in no credit or an NC. And basically that was a student that had, had, had earned the credit, but based on their attendance, we would take that credit away. As we've looked at this and as we started to look at our impact or our RTI, we realized that we really need to separate this, that they are separate issues. Student performance in the classroom is one thing, behavior is another issue, and then there are attendance interventions. Um, just to let the board know, we issued 246 no credits last year combined between our high schools. Um, so that was 246 credits that students would have earned had they not missed the, ten, had they not missed the nine days and been present. 
So in working with the assistant principals at our high schools, we've, we've looked to revamp uh, the high school attendance portion. And I, I want to just kind of point out a few things. The first thing you'll notice is that we're going to um, make contact with parents three times. The old way there were, there were two, uh, there was a requirement of two notices. This will, would require three at five absences, at eight absences, and at ten absences. And then at ten absences, it, it asks for the principals to sit down with the student and, and their parents to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Why is it that you're missing ten days of school? What is it that we need to do? You know, is it is it a legitimate sick? You know, have you had some type of, uh, you know, you broke your arm and you missed a week of school? Is it that you're struggling here? You know, but to have those conversations. So we've moved all the things that we could have done with the old system into the new system, but really it's going to focus on those interventions. And I, I just, I want to point out, I, I thought it was kind of timely, but uh, the superintendent passed out some stuff I think Mrs. Gilkey, maybe you have received from the school boards, and it, it talked about what were the recommendations for policymakers when it relates to student attendance, and what are the re recommendations for educators. And one of the things was for schools should track individual students' at attendance and, and have interventions. So this is really flowing more in line with what folks are doing around the state. It had been an outdated policy. We really felt like it wasn't working, um, and these were the, uh, the changes that we made to it. So um, certainly we'll be happy to enter entertain any questions. This is just the first reading, um, so if you want to take a look at it, if you have questions, let me know, but I uh, wanted to bring this before the board. This would be something that we would bring back, vote on in December, and would like to implement for the second semester. Yes, sir. Travis, um, the original policy said eight days per semester. Uh, it said nine, I think. Actually. Or nine. Mm -hmm. I can't. It's crossed out. It and then nine. below it says that five days. Is are you leaving the language per semester? It's per semester. Okay, yes. that's not. At least I'm missing it. I'll I'll clean that up per uh, semester. It just says it five days, so we'll add that. Thank you. And then just a just a question, maybe a little rationale, and I think. We went down this road once before, but if a student has perfect attendance, mm -hmm. they're not required to take the final exam. We added that in there as an incentive. That is something we had not had before. We could do it, you know, a teacher could do it at an individual classroom, but that was one of the things that the superintendent had kind of shared with me that he felt had been uh, effective in some other places he'd been. So as, as we met with the assistant principals, we, we did add that. that if they're, and, and perfect attendance means perfect attendance. And does, does it... Does it say perfect attendance in an A or perfect attendance in an F and you don't have to take final It says perfect attendance and they don't have to take the final unless it would benefit unless a student. Benefit. Clearly if a student had a C and it go take a final to get an A would raise their grade, certainly they have the right to do that or, or could do that, certainly. It's really trying to reward and incentivize our kids that are doing the right thing. Travis, I'm looking at page five and... Thank you. Sorry, sorry. I'm saying thank you. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm looking at page five uh, down at the bottom, one, two, three, and four, and, and uh, my question is we're going to have up to five absences, and the first thing that happens at that point is a letter. Correct. And then we jump up to eight absences, and really it still looks like a letter, right? It I is mean, a legal. Okay. So the first time we have any inter interaction with a parent is at ten absences where we would sit down and actually have a conference, yes. I mean, does that sound, that, that sounds like a lot to me. I, I don't know. I'm, and when you look at the 10 absences, is that 10 one-day absences? Is that 10 straight days? It or is one-day absences. And what we wanted to do, we, it, because this it's the right question, um, it is more contact than what we were making the, the old way. And one of the things we put in here was that it would be excused or unexcused. It's going to trigger that, that, that letter, that, that correspondence quicker. Um, I, I will tell you that, that this, is, in my mind, is the minimum. I, I think that, that our schools are doing a lot of the extras and counselors are talking to students and they're making those contacts. You know, certainly we can, we can, we can do additional things, but these, these would be the minimum steps that we would guarantee to, to get the, the communication out there. I, I, I clearly understand your point. This is going to notify folks quicker and bring that conference on faster to where we can have interventions as opposed to just saying that you missed too many days, we're not going to give you credit. Okay. And is, is there any, I guess, confirmation that the letter was received on the five days, eight days, or is it just we, we send it and... We don't send those yeah. certified okay. because of the expense. Okay. Travis, Mr. 
Mother, sure. do we still um, also, because my daughter graduated in 11, do we still, like if she missed school, I, I get a phone call at home saying your daughter wasn't at school today. So there's daily we, we contact do. to let the parent know that the child wasn't at school via th that method. Do we still do that? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. And the other thing, too, I think the reason why we chose 10 as the number is because roughly that's 95% attendance. Once a student has missed 10 days, they are now below 95% attendance for the school year. So that's 95% attendance, which is a high mark. But we feel at that point, once you've missed 10, we need to have a conversation. Is there a chronic illness issue that perhaps we need to address? Are there, are there other reasons why the student's chosen not to come to school? Let's investigate and figure that out. And so uh, we felt that just looking at the enormity of a number of students we have, we felt that, that that was the number for us to make sure we bring parents in and have that parent conference. And that's, that would be at the 95% attendance level. Okay, one, that spurs one more question. Are, are these full absences or are these like I'm um, four or five hours late kind of absences or, or both? It, when, it, when they miss enough to be counted as a day, then we'll count them as a full day. If a okay. student comes in, if a student is habitually late for school, they sign in, that, that's, that's something different. You know, okay. If I'm just 20 minutes late to school 15 times, mm -hmm. that's an habitual party and, and we take that's care of those. 15 separate. is an exaggeration, but yeah. just to make the point, I, it, it's two separate issues. Okay. Okay. One we think would be discipline, and the other would be more than some threat. Gotcha. Thank you. Can I ask another question now? Sure. Since Mark's done. Um, <laughs> but actually, I didn't have another. The question spurred from Christina's phone call. The school messenger program, mm -hmm. could we not incorporate this in Mark's question for it to call automatically earlier before these at 2, at 3? I mean, where... <laughs> Where are the parents home phone out? Your kid's not here, your kid's not here. The school messenger program does have an attendance component, and so that is possible, that an automatic call can go out um, at whatever time we designate. So that's something that we can look at. Thank you. They can't learn if they're not in school. That's the bottom line. So we need to make sure they're there. Any other questions? All right, thank you, Travis. No action, that was first reading. So that'll come back to us the first meeting in December. The next action item is a resolution regarding sequestration. And think about, don't say that too frequently, an authorization to issue a press release. And board, as you know, the National School Board Association is asking school boards, local school boards, to um, develop a resolution, uh, which has been done uh, by Mrs. Lewis. And that resolution um, is basically dealing with this issue of a federal federal legislation called the Budget Control Act of 2011. Do you want to speak to this since you're sitting there, or do you want me to Whatever is your go ahead and if you'd like. This is just a recommendation from the National School Boards Association. The Budget Control Act of 2011 includes provisions to impose 1.2 trillion uh, in across the board budget cuts. Of that amount, 2.8 percent or more could result in uh, reductions in funds for education. And so we are being asked to pass this resolution and issue the press press release in support of not making the drastic cuts that are proposed and to do an amendment to the Budget Control Act to avoid the impact that it could have on publicly funded schools. And just to give you some more specifics related to this, Title I funds, mm -hmm. which are critical to us, I believe it's about $2.4 million is what we receive from the federal government for Title I, which provides services to, to students in need. Um, that would be uh, drastically hit by this measure. It's hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially that, that would impact uh, our school system alone. And as you know, with our current financial circumstance, we, you know, every dollar matters. So whatever we can do to appropriately um, advocate for our school system uh, and for proper funding, uh, hopefully that's something that we would want to do to 
to just let our legislators know on a federal level how important it is. The NSBA sent an email to me informing me about it, and I forwarded it on to Sandy and Dr. Mellon and copied you all on it. Um, I, I felt like it was an important measure, and I also believe uh, Clarksville and West Clark are going to pass resolutions as well. Is there a motion to approve? Approve. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? 6 0. -oh, thank you. Next is a resolution in interlocal agreement with our Clark County Commissioners. The Salt and Brine. And you never know when it's going to snow around here. We can always need a stockpile of salt and brine. This is a relationship that we've had with the Clark County Commissioners since November of 2010 mm -hmm. when the school board approved a resolution and interlocal agreement uh, authorizing the purchase of salt and brine for the Charleston and New Washington school areas. Uh, we use that salt and brine on our roadways up in those areas. And we would like to maintain a supply of 130 tons of the salt on and for use on an as-needed basis. And in order to purchase an amount to get us up to the 130 tons, we needed another 65 tons of salt for the 2012-13 school year. The cost is $71 per ton. Uh, the total cost would be 4615 4615 for the year. And so we are recommending uh, that the interlocal agreement be approved for us to go ahead and continue this salt and brine relationship. Is there a motion? Mr. Kraft? Second? Mr. Satterley, thank you. Any discussion? We uh, didn't use very much last year, fortunately, and we have new commissioners, so we need to make sure they understand we have that interlocal agreement. Right? Okay. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor? Six so. Thank you. Next is a request for preliminary notice of consideration of non-renewal. Uh, board. Um, this is a annual practice um, that that we ask the board and bring that forward to you uh, for permission to grant those notices or issue those notices. So that's the purpose of this uh, action tonight. And there's a specific motion. Yeah, I'm going to read this because it is specific. Thank you, Sandy. It's on. If it's okay with you, Christina, are you ready? Mm -hmm. On behalf of the Board of School Trustees of the Greater Clark County School Corporation, I move that Dr. Andrew Mellon, Superintendent, issue written preliminary notice of the Board's consideration of non-renewal to those administrators in the school corporation whose contracts may not be renewed as recommended by the superintendent. And is there a second? second. Mr. White, thank you. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? And opposed? Okay, 5-1. Permission to advertise tax anticipation warrants. Board, um, this is also a, a common practice, unfortunately, but we need to, uh, on occasion, borrow money to cover expenditures, and we do that through what's called a temporary um, loan warrant. Um, it's a tax anticipation warrant, and uh, the amounts that we're looking for there would be in the general fund $4 million, Transportation Operating Fund, $2 million, and the Capital Projects Fund, another $2 million. Uh, the money is borrowed through the tax anticipation warrants. They're just temporary loans, and they'd be repaid by December 31st of 2013. And Greater Clark would take these bids, would take bids for these loans. Motion approved. Second the motion. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? 6 0. -oh. Thank you. Refunding of pension bonds. Dr. Deichel. See, and we just asked to borrow money. Now I'm going to come and give you money. <laughs> <laughs> Periodically, as we have uh, bonds outstanding, we can go ahead and refinance them. And with the extremely low interest rates that we currently are experiencing nationwide, this is a great time to go in and look at our bonds and see if we can refinance any of them. So I've met with Thomas W. Peterson, our um, bond counsel, and Hilliard Lyons. And right now, the only one that really is um, good to go would be the pension bond. The pension bond has to be revenue neutral, which means whatever we levy in that fund, we have to reduce other funds correspondingly by that same tax rate or that tax levy. So 
Hilliard Lyons has come up with us refinancing the pension bonds, if you so elect tonight, and it would bring in a savings uh, cash into our fund of $920,000 gross. By the time we get through paying all the expenses, we would be at about 785. This money could be used for any capital type items, and we have another item coming up here to hire an architect, so uh, it could be used for something like that. Uh, it also will reduce our levy in the uh, pension bond by about seventy-two to $79,000. So that means there's less money then that we have to neutralize. So we're asking permission from the board to uh, refund the bond issue. That's okay. so moved. Thank you, Mr. White. Second. Is there a second? Mr. Satterley, thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Go save us that money. Thank you. Now he's going to spend it. And uh, next that's is, right. Yeah, <laughs> now, now how are we going to spend that, Dr. Dyer? We've been experiencing problems at Jeffersonville High School uh, with a roof leakage problem. Um, Steve is here, how good our uh, director of maintenance, and uh, he's done some analysis, and we found out that we are having uh, some, some major problems there. Um, let me see. Water seems to be coming in the building and the masonry walls um, that cover the uh, in the auditorium area. Um, we have improper sealing to the interior block wall. We've already done some preliminary saw cutting, cut out parts of the wall to see what was back there. Uh, we're missing weeps from wall flashings. Uh, we have concerns with the existing original metal wall panels on the front entrance wall at the gym. Preliminary estimates show it's going to be about $250,000. Anything over $150,000, we have to get an architect mm -hmm. to stamp the drawings. So we're asking permission to uh, hire an architect to look at the roof issue, develop the drawings, the specifications, and then we'll come back later uh, to get permission to advertise it. Then we'll bring it to the board for approval once it's bid, and then we would uh, hopefully fix it for good sometime in the spring. So we're asking permission to hire an architect for this issue. Is there a motion? I think that. Well, I'll move to approve. I think that. Is there a second? A second. And I'm assuming we have some discussion or questions. Well, the question was, we wonder why this wasn't found when the building was, when we were spending a, a ton of money to remodel. But you weren't here to answer that question, so I, it's an unfair question it's, for you. It's a good How, question. However, Steve, if Steve might be able Steve, to answer okay, that. Steve is Steve still back? Okay. He's, I don't know. And while look, at he's look, up, look at how dressed yeah. up Steve Hyde yeah. is. Oh. Wow. wow. He was pretty, <laughs> pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, when we originally did the roof and uh, the rest of the building for the renovation, the vertical unit, this is what it is, up above the, the auditorium, we actually have a vertical structure that houses some equipment. So it's masonry in design with brick and, and block. We didn't look at that. We looked at the main horizontal roofing that we replaced. And so this wasn't looked at at that time as part of the study by Gibraltar. After we put the new roof on, we still had some leaks around the perimeter. We were wondering, well, you just put a new roof on. Why are we having these problems? Mm -hmm. And so well, then we started investigating that it was coming through the block and the brick up on the vertical structure on the roof, which wasn't addressed during the renovation. So it's, you know, the architect didn't see it. We weren't having those kind of problems where we were having some rains like we have recently. So you can, you can walk around the hallways and you can see where it's, it's wet, and that's what's causing it. So that's what we're asking for is to remedy that. If you remember on the front of the gymnasium, we had leaking all across that. And we actually went in and had approval and had a design done of these vertical panels, metal panels that were put in. That stopped it. And we're looking at probably the same type of fix this time rather than tearing out all the masonry. Okay. And I, I think, oh, I'm just gonna, it just seems like we missed something, we pay for it. They missed something, we pay for it. So. Well, even if they'd caught it, we paid for we it. We would have paid for it. You know, so it's, you know, it'd been nice to do it at the time right. when you had everything mobilized, yeah. but yeah, just because they miss it doesn't mean they have to pay no. for it. No. no. That's okay. the way life is. No. What, what's the chance of their, if they take part of that off, there's mold? What's uh, the chance it, of that? It, it doesn't have that kind of atmosphere. Okay. you got to have heat and everything. That's okay. not a heated area. All right. So we have cut into it, like Dr. Deichel said, 
to find out exactly what's going on. We haven't seen any problem of mold disinfiltration. Okay. Who's our architect on that? That's what we're looking to. Oh, you mean on no, this? Gibraltar. We're looking to Gibraltar. hire an architect. No, I know, but Gibraltar, Gibraltar was Gibraltar the did the one. renovation, of the design for the renovation edition of the school. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're probably not going to look at them again this time. No I would not. Okay. And my question on that is, um, once we give you approval to hire an architect, then we have to bid that out, correct? Yes. Well, you don't bid. It's professional services, so you don't actually <coughs> bid it. You usually go out for requests for qualifications, things like that. Or if you bid. Right. And then with that, we get design. And then from the design and the specs and drawings, we go out for bid. Okay. My question is, how do we how do we have our architects compete to ensure that we're getting the best rate? If, if well, we're not again, bidding. It's, it's not always about rate. Now we we do have standards of the cost of a estimated cost of the project will tell us what the estimated cost of the ar architectural services should be. Okay. So we know what range that should be in and the type of work it is. Of course, this one's going to be probably a little bit more toward engineering than it is architects. But from that, we have a good idea where they should be. But then we put the criteria together of what they need to come up with, submit to us with qualifications, and then that's how they fit. So the quality of previous work will be a consideration. Definitely. Doesn't yeah. it still have to be yeah. lowest and best? I'm sorry? It doesn't have to be lowest and best? Oh, no. Not, a, not on professional services. As we look at, as we look at an architect, yeah, I think the key factor is that, that we evaluate uh, who we believe will will come in and give us the best idea. We, we tell them, here's what we're looking at. Here are the different uh, specifications uh, that, that we're trying to attack here. And then they uh, come in and, and make give us the idea of how it's going to be done and so on. And I think with architects, with a, a, a project of this size, it's not unusual to, to go to um, – it's not as a competitive environment as it would be if you're doing a multi-million dollar project. Uh, this is, n even though $250,000 is a lot of money uh, in, the, in the scheme of things, uh, it's not unusual for architectural firms to take on these projects uh, without it going out for some kind of a bid or extremely competitive environment. So um, there's a little bit of a difference depending upon the, the amount of money you're looking to spend on a project. If it was a larger project with millions of dollars involved, now you you have architectural firms compete for the business. We trust your state. Yeah. Well, and, and this is at the size where we would go to probably a local architect uh, because they would need to visit constantly on the on the project, and uh, somebody we would be definitely comfortable with, somebody that would have a background in this type, just like Dr. Mellon said, that we could show that they've done this, they know what they're doing, you know, and that's how we look at it. Uh, you know, it's like your car. I, I really wouldn't go get the cheapest person to do a, a work on my car and for professional services that we, we look at the whole picture because their design is going to dictate how the things constructed so that's so important and and we are required because the cost is going to be over 150,000 we have to hire an architect it's required by yeah it's required by state law right and the the amount of the project uh, for prevailing wages this year it went to 250,000 after January 1, the prevailing wage scale goes up to 350000 So anything from zero to 350000 as of January 1 does not require prevailing wage. Anything over 350000 would. So we're hoping that this would, at that time, fall out under the 350, so we wouldn't have to pay prevailing wage. Get a little bit more bang for the dollar. But they didn't raise the bid law. No. Any other questions? All right. All in favor? Thank you, Steve. Snazzy. That's a nice job. Snazzy Steve. Got to trust the guy looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> Next, we have an ECA equipment purchase request. Okay. Basically, what we have here is any purchases from the extracurricular for equipment has to be approved by the board. And uh, so we have here uh, various items. Maple Elementary uh, needs the approval for three lumen. Uh, Portable XGA document camera with autofocus at 599 each, uh, freight included. So uh, the total price is $1,797. Motion to approve. Second, Mr. Second. Satterley. All right. Any discussion? All in favor? No. Wait. 
Go oh. back in. I was distracting. I'm sorry. Back in. Me. The motion is to approve the purchase of the equipment. And it was 6 out. Mr. Satterley seconded. Next is Jeff High um, baseball field contract. Mr. Hare. Just, um, Dr. Mill, with your permission, board, what I'd like to do, um, I, I really think we need to do this in kind of two steps if we can. It's okay with you, Dr. Mellon, and, and really maybe do two recommendations. Uh, let me give you an overview of what I think the two steps are. Um, you all are aware that there's a hitting facility out at Jeffersonville High School that has kind of been ongoing with the construction and ongoing for several years. Um, in meeting with the, the parent groups and, and uh, those folks, really one of the things that we think we need to do is go ahead and, and try to get that project wrapped up. So in working with Steve Hobgood, we, we've worked uh, and, and we have a bid um, to, to finish the hitting facility and um, we would like to recommend that L.L. Bailey and Son would be able to finish that hitting facility mm -hmm. at, a, at the price of $40,438. And then in doing so, um, the second piece is that, that we would like to enter into an agreement with the baseball boosters to pay back mm -hmm. some of that money. Now, you will recall that the board had previously approved them for a $15,000 loan, so they owe us $15,000. Um, we, we have agreed with them that they need to pay $30,000 of the 40000 that you would approve for a total of $45,000 that needs to be repaid. Um, we would like to enter into an agreement with them that they would pay $7,000 um, over those five years and they've already paid us one payment of the $7,000 so there will be four payments left over the next four years. So um, I, I don't know if you wanna, how you want to do this but I, I think we need to approve both. Well, of those and again, board, not too dissimilar from our Charlestown High School baseball softball arrangement. I think uh, these, this is a situation where we're trying to clean up situations that we've been dealing with for years. A tennis building is going to come your way down the road too. This is not how we want to conduct business in the future. We're trying to finish these projects to get so kids can use them and our public can use them and that was their purpose. So we want to get these accomplished, get these finished. In the future, any building project needs to go through our capital projects uh, uh, plan uh, before we you know, commit to something like this. So we have the capability financially to handle this currently. We have a written contractual agreement through the boosters that, that uh, Mrs. Lewis has developed. Uh, I think we've gone about, we've done a great job. Mr. Hare's done a great job trying to facilitate all of this. And just want to let you know that we're just trying to wrap these, tie up these loose ends. This is not how we'll be conducting business in the future. And you were asked, we're okay with just accepting both. I don't see any legal issue taking both to you. And well, I'm, I'm moved to approve both items. And I'll second. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? 6 0, thank, thank you. Thank you. Next, we have a community partnership and education agreement. Board, uh, we'd like to recommend the approval of the community partnership and education agreement with Community Action Southern Indiana Head Start. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've attached that agreement for you, and it uh, meets the federal requirements for community involvement with volunteers. And our choice program will work with Community Action Southern Indiana Head Start to provide part-time volunteer work and training for students during the 2012-13 school year. So. It's a, it's a good program. Motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. Any questions? Any? All right. All in favor? 6 0. Thank you. Next, we have a Go Solutions agreement. Board, we're asking you to approve the agreement with Go Solutions. Uh, Go Solutions Group Incorporated is the current Medicaid provider for Clark County Special Education Cooperative. And of course, you've had uh, the agreement. It, just know it's a renewal agreement, uh, so it's pretty <coughs> basic and pretty standard. I'll move to accept the agreement. We're in. Second, Mrs. Kraft. Any discussion? All in favor? 6 0. Oh, thank you. Balance calendar. Board, as you know, um, there's been a lot of work done over a period of time on this whole balance calendar approach, and, and uh, our expert in this area is uh, Mrs. Schellenberg, so I'm going to turn it over to her at this point. Um, we have a proposed um, draft of a calendar for next year. If you remember last year,
last year, we adopted um, a modified balanced calendar for this year and a tentative outline for a calendar for next year. We've had a task force meet and um, begin to kind of put some details into this, uh, into this format. We'd like to um, uh, put this first proposal out here and then we have corporation discussion scheduled for um, uh, I think the last week in November, take it to corporation discussion and work through some final um, uh, details with it before we bring it back for approval. Um, the first thing that you'll notice is that um, typically our teachers um, in the past few years have been working three days, have had three teacher days before school started. And this mod modification would make it two full teacher days before with students starting on Wednesday um, and students will be starting July 31st, which is also a change for us. Um, August, uh, there would be a full month of school in August and September um, moves along as well with just Labor Day off. Mm -hmm. In October, <coughs> um, we would propose that um, uh, the end of the quarter would end right there at the first week of October, and um, right around 46 days. If you notice, there is a T listed on Friday. This is one of the things that we need to get into discussion about with the um, Teachers Association. Um, if you look at the following two weeks, we have a week break, similar to what we did this year in terms of fall break, but we also have intercession, and actually the first week would be intercession, the second week would be the, the fall break. This year we did not have the intercession, but if you think about intercession as an intensive opportunity for remediation and intervention for students, um, kind of, a, an, of an as you need it uh, opportunity for um, intensive intervention, that's how we're trying to set this up. One of the issues that it brings up, though, is if the quarter ends on the third, on that Thursday, how long is appropriate before parents get feedback from student grades um, uh, in, in, the, in the form of a report card or such? And if we held out similar to what we did this year, it was, it was almost eight days, nine days, ten days past the end of the quarter before grades were actually delivered. So we need to talk to the teachers about what really is feasible in terms of closing out a quarter and how much time is needed. What we've got up here in the proposal is the potential of a half day for teachers on that Friday to come in and complete grades, complete grades by the end of the day on Friday, and then centrally, from central office, we would run report cards and send them out. So that's the model that we have up here in terms of a, of a proposal. Um, we would have the, the week of intervention, and we are in the process, we've been working with the Department of Ed um, and some of our um, other agencies that we work with to kind of look at what would, um, what would the intercession look like, how do we make it feasible, and how do we capture and utilize all the resources that we have available. So we're, um, I think we'll talk a little bit more about intercession after um, the, the calendar is approved. Um, we move into the second quarter. Um, again, we have uh, the day off in uh, November, Election Day, that we've used as a trade-off day. In the past, we were able to um, uh, add hours in order to capture some half days for te parent-teacher conferences. The Department of Ed um, restricts us from doing that now, so in exchange for teachers working parent-teacher conferences in October and in February, we um, utilize that uh, election day as their trade-off day, basically, for working parent-teacher conferences. We have the um, three days during the um, week of November for Thanksgiving. We've That's been um, helpful for us. In the past, we were finding some absentee issues on that Wednesday anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other districts around us have been giving off that, mm -hmm. that, that day on Wednesday. So we've included that in our calendar as well. And then we carry out the end of the second quarter and the end of the first semester in December with a similar half day on the um, 20th, I think it is. Um, we come back um, in January. We would not run intercession over the um, winter holiday. Come back in January and follow through January, February. We would close out the third quarter right before what typically has been spring break and that week right after um, the, the first or the last full week in March would be the intercession with the spring break actually the first week in April. And then close out the, the school year, we still have Oak Day noted on here in May. We have it indicated as a potential snow day. Um, we, we do the 
this every year. Uh, we try to avoid it as much as possible because it's so difficult to get subs for um, for that day. But we, um, you know, if need be, if we would have another, um, uh, you know, weather crisis, we we would have it available to us. And students would end their um, their last day on Thursday, June fifth. Teachers on Friday, June sixth. Uh, again, with a half day to, to close out grades. This is a model that we'd like to take to corporation discussion and just kind of work through with teachers. You know, we're, um, we have issues that look different from second for elementary teachers versus secondary in terms of grade, grades. We have um, IHSAA um, eligibility issues in terms of grades. So we really need to kind of lay this out and, and determine what's going to fit best for our needs. The other thing I'd just add is part of the grading process is with PowerSchool and the ability for our teachers to uh, keep grades um, updated on a fairly continuous basis. The thought process would be that that we, it's sort of the balancing act. Do you allow two and a half weeks to, to transpire before grades come out or do you, you get that information completed sooner so that you can try to intervene for kids? So this was the compromise is to do it with those half day teacher days and we think with power school and, and our teachers using obviously that from a grade book perspective that's a, uh, a good compromise moving forward. So Amy, what we're really doing tonight is we're just having a discussion. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to make sure because it's listed under action, so I wanted to just clarify that point. Right. It, it would be similar to a first reading, similar to the attendance policy, where we can then take it to corporation discussion and um, have feedback there. Have you had feedback yet? Do you have objections that or concerns? We've not had, we've not put this out. This is the first time we've put this out, and okay. I, I think we have some discussions over that half day. Um, you know, whether that's the appropriate, uh, you know, and I think in our mind we were trying a good faith effort to say we recognize that you need time to do grades, but we also recognize we're trying to communicate with parents as, you know, quickly as possible. So we, I think we have those issues to, to work through. I think we feel pretty good about being able to fund intercession. Um, I did talk to the Department of Ed, and they are at the January board meeting um, adjusting how they fund summer school to accommodate schools that are going through this balanced calendar because there are so many districts that have adopted it. So I think we're okay there and in terms of programming. So it's really just, you know, it's, it's new to us. And, you know, I go back to one of the, the biggest reasons why we looked at this was some of the work we had done in terms of how can we increase instructional time prior to testing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at our winter ECA for our high schools, we, we're getting 80 days before, 80 days of instruction. So if you think of an hour class, 80 hours of instruction prior to kids retaking a test, I think, you know, we're hoping that makes an impact. Also, board, I, I think it's important to note, we took it to corporation discussion, uh, the balanced calendar and, and aspects of it at our last, uh, last month. And so this, we'd be bringing it back to them for a second time this month. What, what is the ISAP testing drop in here, uh, Amy? Um, for, well, there's two windows. The, um, the um, first round is right around the beginning of March, okay. kind of the um, end of February, beginning of March of this year. The first round is um, March 4th. It begins March 4th. Okay. Um, so right around that. And then the second round is right towards the end of April, the third week in April, is typically. You have not shown this or shared this with other corporations yet, then? Um, no, not until we um, kind of work through with the teachers. We know that the other corporations um, are looking at the same model. Um, New Albany Floyd adopted the same tentative. Um, and we've been in conversations with them because in the, in the past, traditionally, our, our biggest obligation has been to reserve that last full week in March as spring break if you have students that go to Prosser. Mm -hmm. Everyone in the area agrees to that. Um, but, you know, we, as we've kind of asked questions, we've sent that information out to um, the other corporations as well. And I know it's through the joint meeting mm -hmm. there were conversations as well. I've been asked that, so now I can yeah. have an answer. Good. Thank you. And um, just out of curiosity, Amy, have you had any conversations with Lanesville about what they, how quickly they get their grades out and how they manage that? I've, I've not talked to them about their grades, but we did talk to them about their intercessions and um, uh, just kind of the impact that it's had on them. I don't think they would turn away from from the model that they have in place at all. They're no. very comfortable with it and, and have liked it. But 
we've not talked about when grades were due. Might be a resource for right. us since they've been doing it for so long. We will be for corporation discussion. Thank you for your work on this. You're I know y'all spent a lot of time um, hashing it all out. So. How are you today? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Next, A through F school grades. Board, we thought we would try to give you a, a relatively brief presentation related to A to F grades. Obviously, it's very important um, as the grades came out, and I think it's like anything else. A lot of times, people maybe not have a full understanding of truly what it means. And so if we could um, just give you a little bit of an introduction to it. As you know that uh, per state uh, law, they, they went ahead and changed the process of providing letter grades to school systems. And, and basically I think the main focus is that a letter grade is a reflection of how well students have performed on state assessments. So it would be easy to say, well, this school or school corporation got this letter grade. I think it's important for everyone to note it doesn't necessarily put a value on the total education that's being provided at that school. It's simply a letter grade based upon how well students have performed on state assessments. I think that's important that people understand that distinction. Let's talk about how letter grades are calculated for school districts and schools. For high schools, you can see the main bullet points. They're looking at performance on and of course assessments in both English language arts and algebra one. Um, improvement is also a big factor and if you notice, improvement is a, is a big key. That's where they're getting their growth measures from. And they're looking at um, either a, a potential increase, decrease, or remain the same based upon improvement from grades eight to 10 and then from 10 to 12. So that's a big factor as, a, as they relate to the eventual grade of a school. Graduation rate at a high school level is obviously very important, and so you do get points uh, based upon that. And then college and career readiness, which has been an important element in our state, uh, that is also broken down, and schools can receive a score based upon uh, the number of passing scores on advanced placement exams, um, and whether or not students have earned college credits or whether they've earned an industry level <coughs> certification. At elementary middle school level, Performance is again uh, a big key. How well did students perform uh, in terms of their passage on the I-STEP test uh, in grades three through eight? Growth is again that key factor. How well did each student, or to what level or extent, did each student improve in terms of their cohort group from one year to the next? And there is a typical growth measure that is expected of students and if students exceed that typical growth measure and you get a high enough percentage of them, then you're given bonus points. If you have too many students that are below that typical growth measure or what's called low growth, then you can get a deduction of points. And then participation is another factor here, uh, and that is you have to make sure you have at least a 95% uh, participation in the assessment uh, process. So as you look at our school system, uh, we've listed all of our schools with their final grade and their total points. The total points are a reflection. If you think about a, a four-point scale, with four being an A and three a B, uh, two a C, and one a D, it uh, basically gives you an idea of where statistically they fall out as it relates to all of those measures that I just detailed. So you can see that we do have six schools that receive A's. Um, which uh, obviously we're very proud of all of our schools, but we had six schools that did receive A's. Uh, we did receive, have three schools that, that did earn the D uh, rating just today. Uh, we met with that group and there's a specific, they're called a focus school, and we have to make sure that we're going to put together a particular, a specific plan to address why those schools received the D, and we're very confident in what we already have in place and what we plan on implementing next semester. So that gives you a sense of our letter grades, and again, keep in mind, those are letter grades that reflect performance on state assessments, in particular, uh, related to growth factors. Now, as a corporation, this is pretty comprehensive, but if I can show you, the overall grade for a corporation was a C, uh, 2.56 out of a four-point scale. 
On our elementary and middle school level, we received a C, which is a 2.5. Um, you can see for English language arts and math, it was a 2.5. And as you see that broken down, if you look over to the left, you see performance under English language arts. The numerator is 3,500. The denominator is 4,557. And you get a 76.8% performance, which equates to a 2.5. So basically, we had 4,557 students tested in English language arts on I step, and 3,500 passed that 76.8%, that gives a foundation score of 2.5, which is that C range. Then they break it down. They look at the bottom 25% of students who performed an, on I-STEP, and the bottom 25% in comparing them to the previous year, what was the percentage of those students who exhibited high growth, higher than typical growth? We had 31.3% of our bottom 25% students who went above and beyond typical growth, almost one-third of those students. But the state was expecting 42.5%. Uh, that was the benchmark that we had to achieve in order to earn a bonus point. Because 31.3 is less than 42.5, we did not get any additional bonus points, so it reflects as a zero. Then they also take the top 75% of our students, again, who exceeded typical growth. And you can see we had 31.8% of our students that exceeded typical growth, had high growth, almost one-third of those students tested. But the state, um, you know, was looking at a 36.2%, so we felt short of that benchmark, so we did in the point. Also, in terms of overall group with low growth, you can see the denominator and the numerator it was 36.9%, um, and the state was looking at 39.8 percent, we, we did make that mark. So we did not gain any points or lose any points, um, so we stayed at that 2.5 range. We had 99.6 percent participate of the bottom 25 percent and 99.4 of all remaining. So bottom line is 2.5 is where it stood. And that you can carry that over to the math side and see where that falls. 2.5 is where we were on an elementary level for both language arts and math. The high school, they break it down and it's weighted. They look at English language arts and the course performance, we had a 2.0, it's weighted at 0.3. Math, we were at a 3.0, so we performed at a higher rate or level in math, but again a 0.3 was the weighted multiplier. Graduation rate, we scored a 2.5. Our graduation rate in our district had actually decreased slightly. Uh, from 2011 to 2012, um, and so therefore 2.5 was the score multiplied by 3.3. But college and career readiness, you know, looking at our AP example, um, dual credit opportunities and industry certifications, which has been an emphasis. We got a 4.0, but the weighted multiplier was only 0.1. So if you uh, look down to the bottom of that screen, then all of that comes into play coming across the screen and without going into every little minute detail you can see how math and language arts graduation rate and college career readiness are measured in terms of percentages you can see the points earned for math it was a 2.5 because we did uh, receive we did grow to a certain acceptable level um, according to the state from 8 to uh, Tenth, from, pardon me, from 10th grade to graduation, we earned 0.5 bonus points. On the English language arts side, you can see we were only at a 1.5. That's a, a concern to us. Um, we did not have the growth from 8 to 10, but we did have a significant enough growth from 10th to graduation to at least earn 0.5. So as you add that up coming across, graduation earned 2.5. College and career readiness was 4 and it all comes out to a 2.65, which is a C for us at a high school level. Keep in mind that's Jeffersonville High School, Charleston High School, and New Washington High School. So it's a pretty comprehensive analysis, and uh, if we could go to the next screen, uh, I think it's important to note that the law requires the State Board of Education to intervene if a school has received an F for six consecutive years. We have no worries there. There are focus and priority schools. I mentioned we have three focus schools, uh, Parkview, River Valley, and North Haven. We uh, are meeting and, and talking about what we need to 
do there, and we will make sure we get our schools moved out of that D range for next year. So the next slide will show uh, some important notes. Remember, I think we can't forget the level of improvement that we've had as a school system the previous three years. You know, 13.4% improvement in language arts passage from 2009 to 12. That's significant. That greatly exceeded the state average. Math was 18.2% improvement in passage over three years. So the thing that's a shame is all that growth that we had in terms of passage doesn't help us as much because now it's an individual student growth measures for each and every individual student that is also part of that model. So we can't just focus on kids passing these assessments. We have to focus on kids growing, at least to typical growth, but preferably to high growth. Um, we believe that it's less than 2% of our students. If we improve the performance of less than 2% of our students in our corporation, by next year we can go from a C district to an A district. Less than 2% of our corporation. So, you know, it's less than 200, probably closer to 180 students total can make the difference between a C and an A. So it's, it's very, uh, it's reasonable and realistic. Next one. What have we been doing? Uh, we've already, our building level administrators and building staffs have already broken down these results on a school basis. They're identifying individual students. They're figuring out who they, who is close to getting to that high growth measure, who's in low growth that we need to focus on. Our impact program that we've talked about, it's our response to instruction K through 12. We're uh, getting ready to uh, make a presentation to you at the November 20th meeting related to that. We're going to put that in place second semester that focuses on individual student <coughs> intervention. We're also going to continue the utilization of our goal clarity window process. That's been a big reason why we had that great improvement over three years, uh, thanks to my predecessor and the development of a corporation-wide strategic plan that we're currently engaged in that for longer term, you know, how are we going to make sure we get where we need to be and get to even higher levels. So those are next steps that we are currently engaged in. And if, if anyone wants additional information related to this ADEF accountability, uh, there's a website. You can just go to the DOE website. So there's a lot more to it, but I just thought it would be important for everyone to understand where we are. The key points are that we have made great strides over three years. Uh, we know exactly where we stand. If we can improve the performance of less than 2% of our kids across our district, it is very possible for us to go from a C to an A. It might be more reasonable and realistic to at least go from a C to a B, but our goal would be to try to excel and have that high expectation to get to A's. And, and I know all of our building level staffs feel that way too. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. I don't think anybody understands how complex this thing is. Thank you for breaking it down for all of us. I mean, because if you're not seeing it and looking at it and studying it every day, I don't think there's any way to really comprehend it. So I, I appreciate the information. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? All right. Uh, Ms. Christensen, do you have any uh, a board report or no, a request? Mr. White? No, I do not. Mrs. Kraft? No, thank you. Mr. Satterley? No, thank you. Mr. Payton? I do not. Okay. We do not have any public comments on non-agenda items, correct? Okay. Ms. Christensen, do you have a board comment? I hope you will forgive me, Madam President, for taking the lead on this. I would like to welcome my successor who is sitting out here in the audience, Ms. Ms. Teresa Butter Perkins. She will be joining the board here, and it got very late last night, and I did not get to say congratulations. Welcome, and I hope you find a good seat from out there, because from back here, it's this is the one. Come on up later on and check it out. Mr. Forgive White? me, ma'am. Is that all? Oh, I don't know what his successor is. Oh, Tony. Mr. Gilbert uh, is being successed by Tony, Mr. Tony Hall, uh, who uh, was unable to make it this evening. But. Mr. White? I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight and uh, for the students that spoke from Jeffersonville High School. I do appreciate your concerns and, and they do not fall on deaf ears. I promise you uh, we hear what you say, but we also have tough decisions that we have to make. And uh, But I want you to know we do hear and we do care. Thank you. Mrs. Kraft? 
I just want to invite everybody to Rockies on Tuesday night for the Jeff High ba Basketball Girls. <laughs> Here's the schedule if you need one. <laughs> We're supposed to eat at Rockies, and they give 20% of the check to Jeff High Girls Basketball Team. And what is that, Mrs. Kraft? Do they donate 20% of their profits back to the basketball <coughs> team that night? For but you have to you have to take that with you, correct? You have to take that flyer I with don't you. I know. Do you have to take the flyer? You have to, well, then yeah. I, we'll have to make more flyers, y'all. We can do that. All right, Mr. Shirley. Well, I'm going to take the second, Ms. Christensen, because I want you to brag on yourself. But Mr. White, I want to congratulate you for retaining your seat. Thank you. This year and. Our president, Ms. Gilkey, as well, for retaining her seat this year. Thank you. So congratulations to the both of you. Yeah, I will. Ms. Pavey. I can't really follow that, so thanks. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. And I wish the students were still still here. I would definitely echo what Jerry said. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mellon. I believe he has some things to say. Just a couple final uh, thoughts. Uh, first of all, our Charlestown High School football team will be competing Friday for a regional championship. Uh, we've had uh, a very strong Jeffersonville High School football program, had a great year, and we're thankful that the Charlestown High School team is where they are in terms of regional competition. The game is at 8 o'clock uh, Friday because uh, Gibson Southern has got to drive a long way. So the um, game is at 8 o'clock this Friday, and it will be a big crowd, I'm sure. So we're very proud of them. Uh, also, of course, Veterans Day is coming up, and our schools will be recognizing that. We're in session, obviously, but our schools, obviously, will recognize that with different programs, different curriculum, and we can never forget the sacrifices of our, of our veterans. And then the last thing I would just mention is I, I really want to thank my uh, executive team, I think you could see tonight um, a lot of work is being done on a consistent basis. I'm very fortunate uh, to have such a great team, and um, so I want to thank them you know, for all their efforts. And, and Renee sits here quietly and makes sure everything goes along smoothly, and, and I really appreciate her efforts on a daily basis to help us uh, uh, do well. So thank you. All right. With that, I need a motion, motion to, adjourn. to adjourn. And a second. second. All in favor? All right. Good night.